So uh, we got a half hour? We got a half an hour, uh, and if we'll we try. we go over five minutes, we'll be okay. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. But that. maybe not more than that. Five and a half. <laughs> five and a half minutes. So. Yeah. Uh, thanks for taking the time to talk with us. I appreciate it. Great to be with you, Steve. Uh, I have been reading a history of part of the Cold War. Dwight Eisenhower was president. He's meeting his cabinet sometimes in this room where we're sitting. Uh, the Soviet Union has emerged as a major nuclear threat. The country is very worried at this point in the 1950s. Uh, but Eisenhower is convinced that they're not that strong, that the United States is stronger, that the U.S. will win if we just avoid a huge war. And he decides to try to reassure the public, gives a series of speeches saying, keep your chin up, everything's fine, our strategy is working. It's a total failure. The public doesn't believe him. <laughs> he is accused of a failure of leadership. Uh, and his approval rating goes down. Are you going through the same experience now with regard to ISIS? Well, I tell you, first of all, uh, I wasn't the supreme allied commander uh, helping to defeat Hitler. So he had, some he had a little credibility that he was working with. Uh, but ISIL is also not the Soviet Union. And uh, I think that it is very important for us to understand this is a serious challenge. Uh, ISIS is a virulent, uh, nasty organization. Uh, that has gained a foothold in ungoverned spaces, effectively, in Syria uh, and parts of Western Iraq. We have to take it seriously. Uh, they've shown in Paris uh, what they can do in an organized fashion. And in San Bernardino, what we've seen is their ability to uh, proselytize for their uh, perverted brand of Islam uh, and spur uh, small-scale terrorist attacks, and those are very difficult to detect. So it is going to be important for us to be vigilant. We are pounding uh, ISIL's core uh, structure in Syria and Iraq. We have put together a coalition that is increasingly effective. We have uh, seen ISIL lose about 40 percent of its populated territory in the region, uh, and both in terms of homeland security and in terms of uh, our efforts over there, uh, I'm confident that we're going to prevail. But uh, it is also important for us to keep things in perspective. And this is not an organization that uh, can destroy the United States. This is not a, a huge industrial power uh, that can pose great risks to us uh, institutionally or uh, in a systematic way, uh, but they can uh, hurt us, and they can hurt our people and our families. And so I understand why people are worried. The most damage they can do, though, is if they start changing how we live and what our values are. And part of my message over the next uh, 14 months or 13 months that I am remain in office is to just make sure we remember who we are and make sure that our resilience, our values, our unity are maintained. If we do that, then ISIL would be defeated. What is the public missing about your strategy? And I say that simply because, according to polls, yeah. you don't have very much approval for it. Well, I think what's fair is, is that post-Paris, you had a saturation of news uh, about uh, the horrible attack there. And... Uh, you know, ISIL combines viciousness with very savvy media operations. And as a consequence, if you've been watching television for the last uh, month, all you've been seeing, all you've been hearing about is uh, these guys with masks or black flags who are potentially coming to get you. And so I understand why people are concerned about it, and this is a serious situation, but uh, what is important is for people to uh, recognize that uh, the, the power, the strength of the United States and its allies uh, are not threatened you by were... uh, an organization like this in the, in the same way that uh, Al-Qaeda was able to carry out one spectacular attack. We ended up making some significant changes to harden homeland defenses. Mm -hmm. It then took a while for us to ultimately snuff out core Al-Qaeda in the Fatah, and there are still lingering remnants. But 
at no point was there ever a sense that, in fact, it could uh, you know, do catastrophic damage to us. You referred to ISIL's sophisticated media operation right. and also referred to what Americans are seeing in the American media. Right. Are you suggesting that the media are being played, in a sense, here? Look, uh, the, the media uh, is pursuing ratings. This is a legitimate news story. Uh, I think that uh, you know it's up to the media to make a determination about how they want to cover things. There is no doubt that the actions of ISIL are designed to amplify uh, their power and the threat that they pose. That helps them recruit. That uh, adds in the twisted thoughts of uh, some young person that they might want to uh, have carry out an action, that somehow they're part of a larger movement. Uh, and so I think that the American people absorb that, understandably uh, are of concern. Now, on our side, I think that there is a legitimate criticism uh, of what I've been doing and our administration's been doing in the sense that we uh, haven't, you know, on a regular basis, I think, described all the work that we've been doing uh, for more than a year now to defeat ISIL. And so if people haven't seen the fact that, in fact, 9,000 strikes have been carried out against ISIL, if they don't know that uh, towns like Sinjar that were controlled by ISIL uh, uh, have been taken back, or that a town like Tikrit that was controlled by ISIL now has been repopulated by uh, previous residents, then they might feel as if uh, there's not enough of a response. And so part of our goal here is to make sure that people uh, are informed uh, about all the actions that we're taking. But one of the interesting things that you've seen uh, evolve over the last several weeks, including in the debates that are taking place between the Republican candidates, uh, is that those who are critics of our administration response or the military and intelligence response that we're currently mounting, when you ask them, well, what would you do instead, they don't have an answer. And the reason they don't have an answer is because the truth is, is that the approach that we are taking uh, is one that's based on the best counsel and best advice of our top military, top intelligence, uh, top diplomatic teams. And uh, you know, we are going after ISIL effectively. We're going after them hard. And uh, we're confident that we're going to prevail. Your critics uh, have said they want to use more force. Uh, you have sometimes responded by suggesting that people who want to use more force want another Iraq war and that that is not practical. Well, when you listen to them, though, and you ask, well, what exactly are you talking about? Well, we're going to bomb more. Well, who is it that you're going to bomb? Where is it that you're going to bomb? When you talk about something like carpet bombing, what do you mean? Uh, we carry out precision strikes based on intelligence of where ISIL is, where their infrastructure is, where their oil tankers are. And if the suggestion is, is that we kill tens or hundreds of thousands of innocent Syrians and Iraqis, uh, that is not who we are, and that would be a strategy that would have an enormous backlash against the United States. It would be terrible for our national security. And you know, unfortunately, many of these critics can get away with just suggesting that bombing more uh, or being less discriminate in how we approach that uh, would make a difference. And you know, when I, let me put it this way. Uh, I trust my commanders, folks who have fought long and hard in places like Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, when they describe to me, here's how we're going to gather intelligence, here is how we're going to approach targeting. Uh, we've been at this for a long time in Afghanistan, Iraq, and places like Somalia uh, and Yemen where we've gone after terrorist uh, targets. And the key is to make sure that we've got sound intelligence and uh, I make no apologies for us wanting to do this appropriately and uh, in a way that is consistent with American values. Are you avoiding more force because you were concerned that even a little more force might call for the demand for even more force and you would end up with a large war? No. I, 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 what's interesting is, is that most of the critics have not called for 
ground uh, forces. Ground forces. Uh, you know, to his credit, I think Lindsey Graham is one of the few uh, who has been uh, at least honest about suggesting here's something I would do that the president is not doing. He doesn't just talk about being louder or sounding tougher uh, in the process. Uh, but as I've explained, uh, and uh, I'm, I've tested this uh, repeatedly with uh, our military and intelligence folks, uh, when you start looking at uh, an Iraq-type uh, deployment of large numbers of troops, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 troops, we're now in a situation in which uh, we are uh, committing ourselves uh, not only to going door to door in places like Mosul uh, and Raqqa, which I'm confident that we could do, but uh, we have essentially said to the Iraqis and the Syrians uh, that we're going to govern for you. And that ends up being of an ind indefinite period. So part of what we have to do for a sustained defeat of ISIL is to help local forces develop capacity, do it the right way, do it for themselves with our assistance and our help so that we can actually create a stable governance structure uh, in this region. Now that sometimes requires more patience than uh, simply deploying a bunch of Marines. Our fighting forces are the best in the world. But in order to defeat an enemy like this, what we have to do is have uh, a situation in which people can govern. Uh, you've acknowledged this requires patience. It can be a yeah. slow process. Yeah. During that slow process, there might be more attacks on the United States. In October, before San Bernardino, a Justice Department official stated that he believed that domestic terrorists were a greater threat to the United States than international groups like Al-Qaeda or ISIS. Uh, do you believe that still now after San Bernardino and Paris? I don't know the exact citation uh, that you're referring to. Uh, if you just John, John Carlin on October if, if, if you just look at the numbers, then... Uh, non-Islamic, non-foreign motivated uh, terrorist actions uh, have killed at least as many uh, Americans on American soil as uh, those who were promoted by jihadists. Uh, but what we have also seen is ISIL evolve because of the sophistication of their social media uh, to a point where they may be inspiring more attacks uh, even if they're self-initiated, even if they don't involve complex planning, uh, than uh, we would have seen two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. Now, this isn't unprecedented. Uh, the Fort Hood attack was inspired by Anwar al-Awlaki, uh, who was with uh, AQAP, al-Qaeda in the peninsula or in, in, in Yemen. Uh, and we've seen periodically uh, self-radicalization through the internet uh, or uh, jihadist propaganda. Um, but ISIL is more systematic and more effective in their media, in their online presence, and that raises additional concerns. So you know, part of what we have to do in response is to ramp up countering that narrative online, uh, working with local communities to make sure that uh, we are inoculating ourselves and our young people from this kind of recruitment. Uh, it is a more complicated problem because of the fact that a couple like the San Bernardino couple, you don't see in a way that you would see uh, an organization uh, that is uh, planning a complex plot like 9-11. So in that sense, we have some new dangers, some new concerns that we have to deal with. Uh, but this is not uh, completely new. It's something that we've known uh, could happen for quite some time. And uh, it's something that, uh, as I said over at the National Counterterrorism Center uh, today uh, when I visited, it, it, it's something that uh, we've got some incredibly effective uh, intelligence folks working on every single day. Leading candidates in both parties mm -hmm. have suggested in one way or another that they want to be more active mm -hmm. against this threat. Uh, you have argued for the approach that you're taking yeah. uh, and that too much action would be unwise. What advice would you give 
whoever you're going to turn this room over to in a year or so. Well, keep, again, I would just repeat, Steve, that uh, when you really sort through all the rhetoric, uh, the notion more active or a stronger response. Hillary Clinton spoke is, of a no fly zone. Well, so I was going to say, there, there are basically two things that I've heard people say. One would be, we're just going to bomb more. Uh, and that, uh, I would advise, uh, is not a wise course. Uh, you, you bomb ISIL. You're not trying to bomb innocent people. And that requires intelligence and confidence in our military. Uh, to be able to develop the kinds of targets that we need. Uh, we're already doing uh, special forces who are going to help us gather that intelligence and help advise and assist and train uh, local forces so that they can go after ISIL in areas like Raqqa and, uh, and Mosul. Uh, the other new thing that people have suggested would be some variation of a no-fly zone or a safe zone. This is something we've been talking about for three or four years. The challenge there is that uh, ISIL doesn't have an air force, uh, so the damage uh, done there is not uh, against ISIL, it's against uh, the Syrian regime. And what is absolutely true is, is that we need to make sure that we bring about an end to the civil war in Syria. And John Kerry, through the work he's been doing in Vienna negotiations and this week in New York, uh, is seeing some progress in bringing Russians and Iranians together, but uh, creating a, a safe zone for Syrian refugees, uh, we've tested, you know, we've, we've looked at repeatedly. The problem is, is that again, without a large number of troops on the ground, it's hard to create a safe zone like that. And that doesn't solve the ISIL problem. So my, my point is, Steve, that I think my main advice to my successor, now hopefully by the time I turn over the keys, uh, we've made uh, the kind of progress that I'm expecting and will have pushed for over the course of the next 13 months. You think there'll be a united front against ISIS by I, then? I, I think we will have made significant progress in degrading ISIL by then. But there, there will be a united but, front, this negotiation Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. The, the diplomacy, I think, is uh, is critically important because to the extent that we can get the Syrian regime uh, Iran, Russia, to recognize what we believe is the core threat, which is ISIL, and the disintegration of social order in Sunni-controlled areas in Iraq and Syria, uh, the more effective and faster we can go. But what I would say to my successor is that uh, it is important uh, not just to shoot, but to aim. And it is important in this seat to make sure that you are making your best judgments based on data, intelligence, uh, the information that's coming from your commanders and folks on the ground, and you're not being swayed by politics. Whoever takes over this, this, this office after you, might be a Democrat, might be a Republican, mm -hmm. there may be a Republican Congress again. Mm -hmm. There likely will be a majority of Republican governors across the country, Republican state legislatures, because Democrats have lost so very many elections in the last several years. How much risk is there that they will undo large parts of your legacy, as many of many Republicans actually have promised to do? Well, first of all, I'm confident that uh, a Democrat will win the White House. And uh, I think when you look at the quality of our Democratic candidates and what uh, the Republican Party seems to be offering up, uh, I think we'll do well. Uh, second of all, I think we've got a good chance of winning back the Senate. And uh, the truth of the matter is, is that where Democrats have had problems is we had the misfortune of doing poorly in 2010 when there was redistricting. And in many of the successive elections, Democrats have actually voted uh, at higher rates. And this was true in 2012, for example, there were more Democratic ballots cast for Democratic candidates uh, than there were Republicans. But because of where Democrats live and where Republicans live, and because of the, the nature of the Senate, uh, we end up having problems. So uh, one of the things that I'll be arguing over the course of the next year is to make sure that Democrats 
uh, run an issue-based campaign on the things that we believe in that we care about, and I think we've got a great track record uh, of, of real progress on a whole range of fronts. And if we make those arguments clearly and forthrightly and uh, aren't defensive, uh, then I'm actually confident we'll do just fine. Have you insulated the climate deal, for example, which mm -hmm. is so important to your legacy, from being undone by a future president, given that many of the commitments you made in Paris are not legally binding? Well, keep in mind that the Republican Party in the United States is perhaps literally the only major party in the developed world that is still engaging in climate denial. Uh, even far right parties in other places acknowledge that the science shows the temperatures are going up and that, that is a really dangerous thing and we gotta do something about it. Uh, and the deal that we struck in Paris was a, an example of American leadership at its best. We were able to mobilize 200 countries to make serious commitments that are transparent where Every country is going to be held accountable where everybody chips in. Uh, and it doesn't solve the entire problem, but it puts the world on track to deal with uh, a problem that could be uh, monumental in its effect if we don't do something about it. Now, the Republican Party right now is, is still resistant to it, uh, but uh, I'm confident that given the progress we can make with the clean power plant rule that reduces carbon uh, emissions through Which our power dozens plants. dozens of Republican governors are suing. Well, well, they oppose, but it's under the Clean Air Act, and we're confident that it's uh, within our power. Uh, I think that the signal that we're sending to the private sector that will in turn invest heavily in solar and wind and battery technologies, the doubling of fuel efficiency standards on cars, all these things start taking on a momentum of their own. And we've seen this since I came into office. You know, uh, since, since my inauguration, uh, the amount of wind power has tripled. The amount of solar power has gone up by uh, 20 times. We've seen the costs of clean energy uh, go down much faster than any of us anticipated. And, and the reason is, is because people start adapting, and it turns out, hey, Americans know how to innovate. And, so, and when so they we can't decide, stop you? What, what, what it means is that uh, by the time that even a Republican president came into office, uh, what you would have seen would be a, an, a growing realization that not only uh, should we do something about climate change, but it's, it's not only a challenge, it's also an opportunity, that it's creating jobs, that uh, it's making a difference uh, in people's lives, that consumers are saving money. When I double fuel efficiency standards on cars, that puts money in people's pockets. Uh, when uh, you retrofit a, a building so that uh, it, it's got better temperature control and you cut your light bill by 20%, 30%, you know what? Even consumers uh, or even Republican uh, consumers end up saying that's not a bad deal. Uh, in fact, uh, when it comes to solar power, you've got this weird coalition between environmentalists and tea partiers in some western states uh, because the traditional uh, dirty fuel industry is trying to prevent uh, greater uh, utilization of solar power. And so so a, a lot of these things get institutionalized, not just through government policy, but through uh, the impact that uh, it has on the marketplace and, and the private sector. Mr. President, we're nearing the end of a year where the question of national identity, mm -hmm. who we are, has been a part of one large event after another. I made a list here, in fact. Gay marriage, the Black Lives Matter movement, immigration, the question of whether to admit Syrian refugees into the country, the question of whether to admit Muslims into the country, all of them in some sense touch on that question of who we are. What is the reason, the cause, what has caused that issue of who we are to come forward again and again and again at this moment in history? No, well, Steve, it never went away. That's at the center of uh, the American experience. Y you pick any year or any decade in American history, and this question's been wrestled with. Sometimes it, it pops up a little more prominently. Sometimes it uh, gets uh, tamped down a little bit. Uh, but uh, you know, this has been true since the founding uh, and the central question of slavery and who was a citizen and who was not. 
Uh, it, it was a debate that took place when, uh, you know, there were signs on the door saying uh, no Irish need apply. Uh, it was a debate that happened during Japanese internment in World War II. Uh, it was obviously a debate uh, in the South for most of our history and uh, during the Civil Rights Movement. And it's been a debate uh, that we've been having uh, around uh, issues of uh, the LGBT community uh, for at least most of my adult life. So, so I don't think there's anything new about it. Uh, I, I do think that the country is inexorably changing. I believe in all kinds of positive ways. Uh, I think we are, when I talk to my daughters uh, and their friends, I think they are more tolerant, more welcoming of people who are different than them, uh, more sophisticated about different cultures and, and, and uh, what's happening around the world. Uh, but I do think that when you combine that demographic change with all the economic stresses that people have been going through because of the financial crisis, because of technology, because of globalization, the fact that wages and incomes have been flatlining for some time, and that uh, particularly uh, blue-collar men uh, have had a lot of trouble uh, in this new economy uh, where they're no longer getting the same bargain that they got when they were going to a factory and uh, able to uh, support their families on a single uh, paycheck. Uh, you combine those things, and it means that there, there is going to be potential uh, anger, frustration, uh, fear. Some of it justified, but just misdirected. Uh, and uh, you know, I think somebody like Mr. Trump's taken advantage of that. Uh, I mean, that's what he's exploiting uh, uh, during the course of his campaign. Um, but you know, in in other cases, an issue like Black Lives Matter and the question of uh, whether uh, you know, the criminal justice system applies equally to everybody. I mean, that's been an issue in the African American community and to some degree in the Latino community for decades. There's no black family that hasn't had a conversation uh, around the kitchen table about driving while black and being profiled or being stopped. I think really what's changed over the last several years is the pervasiveness of smartphones and the visuals that suddenly have sparked a, a conversation about how uh, we can deal with it. And although it's uncomfortable sometimes, I actually think that uh, over the long term, uh, it's how, uh, you know, in, in Dr. King's word, uh, you get a disinfectant by applying light, sunlight to it. And, and, and people see that you know what, this is a true problem, and as a consequence, we've been able to have uh, conversations that might not have happened 20, 30, 40 years ago with police chiefs who genuinely want to do uh, the right thing, uh, law enforcement who recognize that they're going to be able to uh, you know, deal with uh, crime more effectively if they've got the trust of the communities. And, you know, uh, during that process, there's going to be some noise and some discomfort, but I am absolutely confident that over the long term, uh, it leads to a, a fairer, more just, healthier America. Sometimes progress is a little uncomfortable. Let me follow up on a couple of things you mentioned. Yeah. You mentioned slavery. Yeah. Among the many protests this year are two small but symbolically interesting ones mm -hmm. at Ivy League universities. Yeah. At your alma mater, Harvard Law, mm -hmm. there's a seal for the school that is based on the family crest of a slave owner. At Yale, there is a school named after John C. Calhoun, right. who was a great defender of slavery. Right. Uh, the call is to get rid of those symbols. What would you have the universities do? You know, uh, as president of the United States, I probably don't need to wade into every specific controversy at a but at you a, can at, do it. We're a, here at a university, <laughs> but but here's what I will say generally. Um, I, I think it's a healthy thing for young people to, to be engaged and to question authority and to ask why this instead of that and uh, to you know ask tough questions about social justice. Um, so I don't want to discourage kids from doing that. Uh, as I've said before, I do think that there have been times on college campuses where I get concerned that um, 
the unwillingness to hear other points of view uh, can be uh, as unhealthy on the left as on the right, and that, um, you know, Meaning uh, listen to people that you might initially right. think are bigoted or... Yeah, you know, there, there have been times where you start seeing on college campuses uh, students protesting uh, somebody like the director of the IMF or Condi Rice speaking on a campus because they don't like what they stand for. Well, you know, uh, feel free to disagree with somebody, but don't try to just shut them up. Uh, if, if somebody doesn't believe in affirmative action, they may disagree. Uh, you may disagree with them. I disagree with them, but have an argument with them. Uh, it, it's possible for somebody not to uh, uh, be racist and want a, a just society, but believe that that is something that uh, uh, is inconsistent with the Constitution, and you should engage. So, so my concern is not uh, whether there's campus activism. I think that's a good thing. Let, let kids ask questions and, and let universities respond. What I don't want is a situation in which uh, particular points of view uh, that are presented respectfully and reasonably are shut down. And we've seen that uh, sometimes happen. And you mentioned Donald Trump taking advantage of real anxieties in the country, yeah. but that the anxieties are real. Yeah. Um, some of that anxiety, as you know, focuses on you, Mr. President. <laughs> yeah. um, and I want to set aside the politicians for a moment uh, and just talk about ordinary voters. Do you feel over seven years that you've come to understand why it is that some ordinary people in America believe or fear that you are trying to change the country in some way that they cannot accept? Well, look, if what you're asking me, Steve, is uh, are, are there certain circumstances around being the first African-American president that might not have confronted a previous president? Absolutely. Uh, I, you know, I, think I don't know it, if that's I, all I, of it. but Well, I'm, I'm sure that's not all of it. It's not all I'm asking anyway. You can well, answer it well, any way you want. Well, you, you, you're asking a, a pretty broad question. I don't know where to take it. So if you want to narrow it down, I can. If, if what you're suggesting is, is that, uh, you know, somebody... Um, questioning whether I was born in the United States or not. <laughs> How do I think about that? Uh, I, I, I would say that uh, that's something that uh, is actively promoted and may gain traction uh, because of my unique demographic. I, 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 don't, think, I don't think that, that that's... Uh, uh, a, a big stretch, but maybe you've got uh, some other well, something I else mean, in mind. Years ago, you made that remark. You were much criticized for saying something about people clinging to guns and religion. This was before you were even elected uh, president. And although you were criticized for the phrasing of that, it seemed to me that you were attempting to figure out what is it that people are thinking, what is it that's bothering people. Well, keep, and now you've had several more years yeah, to think about. Well, that. keep in mind, Steve, I was elected twice uh, by, you know decent majorities. So, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that in a big country like this, there's always going to be um, folks who are frustrated, don't like the direction of the country, uh, are concerned about the president. Uh, some of them uh, you know, may not like my policies. Some of them may just not like how I walk, <laughs> or or, uh, or or my big ears, or you know. So, so I mean, there's you know, no no politician I think aspires to a hundred percent approval ratings. Um, if you are referring to specific strains in the Republican Party that uh, suggest that somehow I'm different, I'm. Muslim, I'm disloyal to the country, et cetera, you know, which unfortunately uh, is pretty far out there and gets some traction uh, in certain pockets of the Republican Party and that have been articulated by some of their elected officials. Uh, what I'd say there is that uh, you know, that's probably pr uh, pretty specific to uh, me and uh, 
who I am and, and, uh, and my background and that in some ways I may represent change that worries them. Um, but that's not to suggest that everybody who objects to my policies may, uh, may not have perfectly good reasons for it. I, you know, if you're living in uh, a town that historically has relied on coal and you see uh, coal jobs diminishing, you're probably going to be uh, more susceptible to the argument that uh, I've been wiping out the economy in your area. And you know, it doesn't matter if I tell them actually it's probably because natural gas is a lot cheaper now. And so uh, it coal doesn't, it doesn't closed, play to, yeah. to, to build coal plants. Uh, if uh, somebody tells you that uh, this is because of Obama's war on coal, well, you know, that's a uh, that's an argument that you may be sympathetic to, and, and that's perfectly legitimate. So, uh, as I said, you asked a pretty open-ended question. I think you were being a little, little uh, coy in, in how you asked it. Uh, I'm trying the, to give the, you the, room the, to answer. No, I understand. You but, but what I'm saying is, is that I think that there's always going to be uh, every president, a, a certain cohort that just doesn't like your policies, doesn't like your party, what have you. Uh, I think if you're talking about the specific virulence of some of the opposition uh, uh, directed towards me, then uh, you know, that may be explained by the particulars of, of uh, who I am. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not unique to that. Uh, you know, I, I always try to uh, remind people that, goodness, you, know, you look at what they said about Jefferson or Lincoln or FDR, uh, finding reasons not to like a president, that's, <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that's uh, you know a, a well-traveled path here in this country.